Welcome tonight to our I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters of Digital Photography program at, at the School of Visual Arts here in New York. Tonight, we're lucky to have Krista Dix as our speaker. And as we said, as you have questions or comments, just put them in the comment box, in the chat box. And I will ask, I will read them out to Krista as we go along. Just so you, you have a little background, Krista Dix is the executive director at the Griffin Museum of Photography. She assumed that role in January of 2022 after two years as the associate director. Before coming to the Griffin Museum, she spent 15 years operating her own photography gallery, Wall Space Creative in Santa Barbara, California, closing it in 2020 to make the move to New England and the Griffin from one coast to the other. With a career spanning many different paths, Krista has a background rooted in science, business, and creative art. This well-rounded experience provides a solid background for supporting the Griffin's mission to encourage a broader understanding and appreciation of the visual, emotional, and social impact of photography art. <coughs> Her gallery wall space supported emerging and mid-career artists and created a charitable giving program called Life Support. In 10 years, Life Support worked with over 400 artists, donating more than $80,000 to char charitable foundations such as Doctors Without Borders, Direct Relief, and Habitat for Humanity. Krista has written essays about, photographer, about photography, introducing creative artists' work to a broader community. She has been a member of numerous panels and discussions on the craft of photography, juried creative competitions, and has participated in major portfolio reviews across the country in cities like Houston, Portland, Los Angeles, Santa Fe, and New Orleans. And without further ado, here's Krista Dix. Thanks, Stella. Thank you, everybody. I'm so, uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here this evening and re hearing my bio sounds very out of body for me. Um, let me uh, share my screen and tell you a little bit about me. Um, I, I came to this curatorial, uh, sort of idea, or uh, I came to the Griffin and through a very, very long way. Um, I started as a retailer, I was in theater, I got a degree in geology. So I pulled from all of those sources and realized um, as a photographer, I wasn't a great photographer, but I really was much better at curating and finding work that was uh, far better than my own. So, uh, I opened Wall Space in 1999, um, and I started with eight commercial photographers who had personal bodies of work. And as I continued to grow and find new work, uh, I expanded to over 40 artists from all over the world. Um, I specialized in uh, object-oriented photography, um, things that were tactile handheld objects, uh, as well as narrative and storytelling type work. Um, tonight, the focus is on, let's see if I can get this to move forward, um, the curatorial process and how to work with, uh, it, how it works between curators and uh, artists and museums and galleries. Um, I really, really, really am not good at, at speaking unless of course you give me a greyhound and we're sitting in a bar, then I can talk forever. But uh, I really do hope that uh, you all have plenty of questions for me. So where do we start? How does a curator find you? Um, anywhere and everywhere. Um, our goal is to absorb, see, engage with as many artists and as much image uh, information as possible. Uh, our ideas are very disparate. They're often disjointed. Um, we have an idea for an exhibition about color or an exhibition about aging or an exhibition that um, engages us somehow in a, in a new reality. And uh, so we start hunting for those those images. Um, as, as I say, we are in a relentless pursuit of new. So always, always, always show us your newest work. Show us what engages you, what excites you. Um, in a conversation between artists and curators, the best conversation is the one that's the most animated. 
the one where you and I both learn from each other. Uh, I find that I can grow as much from our interaction as hopefully you can grow uh, from talking with me. So how do we hunt? Um, we hunt through submissions. Now that can come through in any number of ways. Uh, we're looking at either work that's coming through the museum or in my case, uh, in the past of the, the gallery, um, many galleries do have submission policies. Um, a lot of galleries say that they're not accepting submissions. I think what they're doing is gatekeeping a little bit. Um, we're always looking. So it never hurts to engage with the gallery, but I think that you can do that in, in different ways through personal contact, through going to exhibition openings, to continuing to network. Uh, if there's one thing that I can say tonight over and over and over, it is networking, it's conversations, it's playing the long game. Um, nothing comes easily and nothing comes quickly for either side, for us as curators or for you as artists. Um, we do find a lot of work through artist referrals. Um, so if we're working with artists and they know that we're working on something, uh, they say, oh, hey, you know, I just saw some work that's really interesting and follows in the path of something that I know that you're working on. Um, that also works with our peers. Um, we often talk to each other. Uh, we may not see each other anymore uh, with COVID and, and everything that keeps us apart, but that doesn't mean we don't email, it doesn't mean we don't call, it doesn't mean we don't Zoom with each other and talk about what we're working on, um, what's coming up in the future. Um, we also hunt art fairs, uh, any public events, studio tours. I, um, <laughs> when we go to uh, Portland or Houston, um, I will never keep my badge on because I want to make sure that our interaction is authentic uh, and not something where you see my name and you're like, oh, I didn't meet with you, but I need to show you this, right? At least if I can approach you and say, tell me a little bit about your work, you're just going to go through that pattern and that information. And then you and I can have an experience that is um, open with the dialogue about, about your images and your information. Um, the other spot that we hunt all the time is social media. I can't say that Facebook is somewhere that I actually look. Um, I spend most of my time on Instagram. Instagram, I'm obsessed by TikTok, but uh, that is a lot harder to, uh, to create um, single images. But I am also interested in moving image now. I wanna see all of what photography can bring and put forth. Um, does anybody have any questions about how we connect or um, ideas about how we can find each other? I have a question, yeah. a question that may be jumping ahead a little, but how far ahead do you schedule shows? Is there, is there some kind of scheduling that you do that would make it more optimal for people when they would reach out to you? Yeah, I've got timing next, or at least sort of next. There you go. Okay. Hey. So, okay. Timing. <laughs> it is all about the timing. Oh, let me go back to this. So real quick, you see this image by Aline Smithson, and I'm going to tell you a little story about the serendipity of how things work. So I was a new gallerist, and I was desperate to get into Photo LA. And, and at the time, it was one of the premier photo fairs in the country to be able to show your work. And there was a waiting list. And I, and I begged, begged uh, Cohen to let me in and he wouldn't do it. He's just like, nope. And I'm like, I can write the check, which of course you, is rare to do too. But I was, I was desperate to get in, I couldn't do it. So I went ahead and took out a full page ad in their book uh, with all the gallery. Info. So the catalog that you would get as you walk through the, the fair. And I put wall space in and about three weeks after Photo LA, I get a package of information from Aline Smithson. And this is back in 1996. Um, no, I'm sorry, 2005. So I get this body of work, the arrangement in green and black, and I'm staring at this beautiful work, this wonderful artist statement. I called her on the phone immediately. We were on the phone for an hour. Um, and sa I said, you know, I'm not really sure what I can do with this, but I can't live without it and let's give it a shot. So 
off we went and I represented her for 15 years. And that came from a magazine ad. So you never know how we are gonna find you. So we're back to timing now. Um, John Travinsky is another artist that I met uh, through another gallery, actually. He uh, had worked with a gallery in Seattle and they were not gonna represent him anymore. So he approached me and of course, his work is all about the intersection of time, space, and technology and communication. Uh, this particular series, he would photograph with his four by five and then send JPEG images to China, have the Chinese create uh, oil paintings, send them back, and then he'd reinsert them into the still life to show that distance of time, space, and interpretation. So he hit at my core of my little science uh, heart. Um, so timing, gallery exhibitions. If you're a for-profit gallery, you're looking at least 12 to 18 months out. You wanna make sure that your artist has plenty of time to create that work. Uh, when you're working with artists uh, that you represent, you always wanna make sure that there's new work coming or that you're engaging about the work that's out there in the universe and seeing how that work is gonna grow. Because as someone that sells your work, we not only sell the, the series that we have, but we sell the series that's to come and we sell you as well. Um, for museum exhibitions, museums uh, take a lot longer to plan. Um, at, at a minimum, you're 18 to 24 months out. So always, 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 always be patient. Um, I, had a, I worked with an artist, uh, at the gallery who ended up having an exhibition down in Florida, but that took five years for her to make happen. So oftentimes it's, it's not gonna be that easy and it's not gonna be that quick. Um, when you are patient, it gives you plenty of time to create the work, modify the work, engage with others, get feedback. And then that way we actually have plenty of time to be able to promote you in upcoming exhibitions, talk to our donors, get everyone excited about the fact that you will be showing at the institution uh, in the future. So does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have one question, uh, two questions actually. Um, Bob Flack is asking if, I know you're busy as a director and curator, but do you make time for private portfolio reviews? I do. Um, as part of the Griffin Museum's program, if you are a member of the museum, you have the opportunity to have a portfolio review with me uh, mm -hmm. that is free as part of your membership. Um, as I have only been in the directorship now for six weeks, um, I am just starting to put together my portfolio program and uh, make sure that everybody has time and access to me. Uh, but it's been a little hectic for the last uh, six weeks to try and, and get everything in place. So next question. When you do um, open calls, how many of them do you do a year? Because you mentioned something like if it was the color red or, or something like that. How often do you do that? Do you have a, a regular schedule for that? Or do you just sort of come up with a concept and put it out there and see what happens? We have a satellite space at the Griffin called Lafayette City. It, it's at Lafayette City Center Place. So in downtown Boston, uh, that is usually an open call, not only for just members of, of the Griffin, but open to the public. Uh, to submit work. And I am desperately trying to get the wording ready for our next call, which uh, should be sometime in the next few days. Uh, and we'll post it on Facebook. We'll do some social media calls for it. And um, if you're a member, it will be on your members community page. So mm -hmm. the Lafayette itself, uh, we program uh, four to six shows a year. Those are all open calls for entry. The Griffin Museum has two in, in Winchester at the museum calls. One is our juried member show. Um, we're gonna open up the call for that uh, on March 1st. We have two jurors for that. That is uh, they, uh, Irita Menjavar and Francis Jakabek, who were previous associate directors of the museum are going to be curating this current and up, uh, upcoming uh, juried member show and that happens in the summer. So the call itself is the month of March and a little bit into April. Announcements are made by May 1st 
for who's going to be in the show. And that way you have plenty of time to prep and prepare your prints for hanging in July. And then uh, we have a members call at the end of the year called Winter Solstice. And that is send us your best print. We don't jury it. We don't ask you for anything other than a JPEG to be able to promote it online. Um, and then you send us the work and we hang it in December. So uh, there will also be, as we head forward, uh, the potential for more calls for entry through the museum. Uh, those are still in process, but Lafayette is usually our, our most common call for entry. And that's about four to six weeks ahead of any, uh, any exhibition, but I'm, I'm cutting it super close uh, because the next exhibition will open at Lafayette uh, March 18th. Ah. Um, as far as portfolio reviews go, if you could talk a little about um, how you see them as a path in order to see new work and photographers that you have not seen before or not come in contact before, how valuable are those and how often do you do those? Um, so, I love communicating with artists. I love the portfolio, the portfolio reviews like Houston, uh, Portland, like Critical Mass, the online review that Portland does, all really, really important to be able to get your work in front of a lot of people. Um, I, those are like my photo vacations. I spend all of my time doing business. So for me to look at those portfolios is to like dive into a beautiful beach and hang out and just have conversations with people and, and talk about their work. Um, so to me, those interactions are really critical. And even if you don't get me as a reviewer, um, I look at, I try to look at everybody's work. Um, if I don't look at your work um, and you wanted, to, you wanted to see me, I try to make room for you. So you can find me. I make myself perfectly accessible. Um, I think that uh, because you're paying so much for that portfolio review, I mean, not only have you paid $1,000 for the review, but you've invested $2,000 in that portfolio. You spend $1,000 to get to the location. As a reviewer, it's, I feel it's my responsibility to make sure that you and I connect in some sort of way. So to me, those interactions are critical to your success in many ways. Um, we have the New England Portfolio Reviews coming up in March and those are online reviews. And I think, you know, there's some things that COVID did that are helpful. There's some things that are really not helpful, but I think the advent of online portfolio reviews where you're having conversations that are literally about the work um, and your intent are really um, beneficial for both of us. If I get, if, if you sit down in front of me and you have a horrible print, you and I are gonna talk about the technical aspects of the print. I mean, after five years of, of working at a camera store and, and selling digital equipment, trust me, I am obsessed with a good solid print, not to mention having to sell them. So if you show up with bad color management, if something is off, if you've got banding, you and I need to talk about your work as an object first before we can even get the, to that conversation about intent. And that usually just completely blows apart your 20 minutes because I know that you wanna talk about the work with me. You wanna engage me about its intent and, uh, and where you would like it to go. But if I get hit with that brick, then, then it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, the submission process, member portfolio reviews, we talked a little bit about that uh, through the Griffin. And I think any, institution like uh, the Center for Fine Art in Carmel or uh, other institutions might actually have that member portfolio review program uh, as well. Being a member of one of our institutions is actually, I think, pretty beneficial because you get to know more about the institution. You get to know more about us. Um, the Griffin is pretty small. I mean, there's two of us that are full-time and there's two additional that are, are part-time. So we basically run all of our programming on, on two, what would be two and a half people or three people. Um, so you have a lot of access. In some ways you have a lot of access to us. And in other ways, it's a lot harder to get to us because if we're super busy, we're trying to do everything we can to get to you, but we may not be able to get to you in time. So that again is where patience is super helpful. Um, yeah. Uh, are there things photographers should not do in the process of networking with you or the museum? 
Yeah, I, uh, I actually put up a what not to do slide way, way down at the end. I thought we'd talk about the positive stuff first, but <laughs> um, the negative stuff, if you're at a portfolio review and you try to submit your portfolio to me underneath a bathroom stall, not going to work. You're going to go to the back of the line. Uh, if I'm out drinking with friends and you scream at me from across the street, can you see my portfolio at one o'clock in the morning? also not going to be a real plus for you. Um, Stella, I'm sure you've had plenty of those too. I think we could go on for, there's a whole book to be written yeah. about things like that. Um, you know, it's uh, don't call or if you're going to, if you're going to approach an institution, call them first, find out what the submission requirements are, if there are any, or say, you know, I'm going to be traveling through town on X date is there an opportunity for me to either leave a leave behind or can I take 10 minutes to, to, to walk you through a small presentation of my work? We will say yes or we will say no, right? Um, there's, an there's always an opportunity, but don't push it. If we say no, there's nothing personal to that. It's just that we literally probably do not have the time or that it's outside of the boundaries of, of what we have offered to people to begin with. So um, making that phone call to a curator or it, getting an introduction from an artist who knows the curator that, you know, you can connect them. Um, I just did a portfolio review with someone who was connected to Ann Jastrab out in Carmel and Ann wrote to me and said, you really need to see this body of work. And so that referral came through and we did that portfolio review yesterday and she will probably have an exhibition later on this year, um, certainly online, if not in person in 2023. So that's always rid uh, ridiculously helpful as well. Um, where do I go from here? Uh, marketing and media. Um, I, I love handwritten things. I love postcards. I think Early, early on at the advance of, uh, advance of email, we all decided, oh, we're going to go green and we're not going to produce postcards or anything. But then they became so impersonal that when you get that object from somebody in the mail, it really means like someone has done the research. They've looked to, to try and find you and to give you content or images that you really are, you, you could potentially be interested in. Now, there's plenty of people that get a mailing list and say, oh, it says museum and I'm going to send you my painting but you know that those are gonna go by the wayside anyway. Um, so, you know, looking at um, how you're producing or marketing yourself, it doesn't have to be super slick. It just has to be confident of who you are and of what you're working on. Um, one of the things that, uh, like Deborah Bay here, uh, I met Deborah Bay at the Portfolio Review in Houston uh, she was a new photographer and she saw my science background, didn't know what the science was because I don't really talk about it much, but her uh, portfolio was called The Big Bang and it was about uh, bullet impacts into plexiglass. Now, this was a long time ago, um, but in that moment, she was somebody that I wanted to work with and I had continued to work with and she and I worked together for a long time for at least 10 plus years. Um, to try and bring her work to a, a broader public. So you never know, um, it's another portfolio success story. Um, and then again, introductions from others. So if you have artists that have connections for you or that you think you might wanna reach out to, it certainly doesn't hurt. All we're gonna say is no, um, but you know, not asking is not even getting the no. I would like to interject just one thing. If you're going to make connections with someone at a gallery or a museum, Make sure you know who the person is that you want to contact mm -hmm. and know that they and and make sure that you spell their name correctly and you have yes. their name correct. And don't assume it's gotten, always a sir. <laughs> I've always gotten things sent to me with the wrong name. I've been called Sheila. I've been called Shelly. Um, you want to you want to just call and say, who is the person who is the curator or who is the person that I would send something to? Can you spell their name for me, please? I think I think that that's vital because too many times people don't do that and if you do if you do it incorrectly if you send it to the wrong person or you don't spell their name right they're going to throw it out just based on that you you go on the list <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> 
<laughs> and you don't want to be on that list. No. And don't and don't always assume that the head of the gallery is a sir. I get that a lot. Um, which is fascinating to me, dear sir. No, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, there are more women uh, that are curators that I know of than, than men, uh, but I digress. So calls for entry. Um, another way to get your work in front of people. So those calls for entry, um, think about it as um, submitting for, you know, when you submit for a group show, don't always shoot for the big dog, which is the, the solo exhibition. That doesn't always happen immediately. Um, getting your work out there consistently, having people see it, have people recognize it. And then they're like, oh yeah, I know that person or I know that work, I, I've got a show for that, right? So it gives you another opportunity to uh, be able to be seen. Um, make a budget for, for jury show or for calls for entry too, because you can start dropping that $35 fee, that $50 fee all the time. And you've spent hundreds of dollars and not, not felt like you've gotten anything for it. Um, know your juror, do the research, find the, um, find the work that they do. Uh, take a look. I mean, while it may not be what they're looking for, for the call for entry of the things that they do in the background, just make sure if you're going to plunk down 35 bucks, that th your work is something, again, the long game that you want to put in front of this juror in case they find it interesting. I have a, a terabyte file filled with work that I found interesting from other calls for entry uh, when I do jury shows. And you never know where it's going to come out. It may not go into the show that I'm working on, but that doesn't mean it might go not go into something later on. Mm -hmm. um, and then being again, being the member of uh, an institution will will help you get more information more quickly. You're probably going to be on the front end of those calls for entry because we'll announce it to our members first and then open it to the public after so that our members have a chance to uh, make that. Uh, be able to submit before anybody else. Mm -hmm. Any questions on the calls for entry? I think we're okay. ready to go forward. All right, so the curator artist relationship, it's a marriage, right? I mean, it is um, not only in, the, in a gallery context or a for-profit gallery, but when we're working on your exhibition, we want to be open, we want to be honest with you, we want to work with you, um, making it, and I know this, it, it can get adversarial for no apparent reason, and I think that ends up because uh, people are misunderstood. So work as a team, right? So if, if a curator's reached out to you, take notes, like what does the curator want? What are they talking about? What is the, the exhibition going to be about? Do you think your work is a fit for that exhibition? Explain why it would work or explain why you think it may not. Um, turning down an exhibition may not be the greatest move, uh, because the, but if you talk with the curator and that curator says, here's why I think your work is important. Here's why I think your work needs to be included. You can start with that conversation. Um, also be clear about your expectations, right? What do you want from this relationship? And we as curators will be very clear about what we want uh, from you as, as we move forward together. Um, work together to design your exhibition. Don't hand us a completely finished exhibition. Uh, that's happened plenty of times before. You say, oh, I'm only doing this. And here you go. And here's where it lays out on the wall. Well, that eliminates us from the conversation, one. And two, we, I, I know I get, I get verklempt. Um, we want to be able to work with you to showcase the work in the best way possible. Um, if you hand us something, it makes us feel like our, our input or our, um, our knowledge base, our, abilities are not valuable to you. Uh, we don't wanna be a pass through so that you can say you had an exhibition at the Griffin, um, yet we had nothing to do with it. We're just hanging images on a wall for you. So, you know, 
again, networking through this, uh, networking, 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 conversations, um, making sure that you are as open and honest with people. I cannot stress that one enough. The concept, Marco was asking, the concept that members are invited to submit, is that specific to the Griffin or do many museums work that way? Well, we're a smaller museum and we love our members. So we, we have created, uh, Paula Tongarelli, our previous executive director, was an incredible uh, curator and an incredible builder of community. So she really set out to make sure that our members felt welcome in the building, felt welcome on our website, um, that they were a part of our team. So, you know, I would say you're going to get out of being a member of an institution, uh, what you put into it as well, or what that, uh, that institution puts into it or offers their members. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I have a question. Do you work with artists to develop their work? You know, I, you find an artist that you like and you're thinking, well, somewhere down the line, we'd, we'd probably want to exhibit them. Do you help them to develop the work? As a gallerist, when I had wall space, absolutely, I did that all the time because that was part of how we moved the body of work forward, how we got it to curators, collectors, art consultants, right? I mean, you want to make sure that you are growing that body of work as you're working with that artist and having that artist grow with you. Mm -hmm. um, in a museum context, I would love to work with someone on a body of work. I mean, if, if that were an option, as long as I can do my job and do my job. Um, and then, you know, because as I say, looking at images, talking about work, talking about ideas is my, is my mental vacation. That's the best part of my job. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would never turn that down if that were an option for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we're moving forward. Okay. Paperwork. Um, the, the nitty gritty of this, um, I'm, I think that it's, again, important to have conversations with your curator, with your institution, with your gallery. Um, always make sure that you have some type of contract or loan agreement. Um, having a, a verbal conversation doesn't always work out, right? So if expectations aren't met, you have nothing to refer back to to make sure that um, that you understand exactly what's happening on your side and what the museum expects on their side. So always make sure when you go to an institution or you have um, an exhibition planned that there is some type of, ask for it. There's no reason not to, right? Um, timelines, timelines, timelines. When you are working with a curator and they give you that list of timelines, we need the work by this date. Uh, we want... JPEGs by this date, we need statements uh, or support by X date. We wanna have um, an artist conversation on this date. Um, make sure that all of those are, are planned ahead or are made very clear so that you can meet those expectations, not only on your side, but on the side of the, uh, the institution. Um, a lot of times people wanna know who covers shipping. Right. I mean, what what happens to the work? Do you I, we get a lot of emails from people like, OK, so I send you the JPEG and you print it. Um, not always. It depends on how badly we want the work. Um, it depends on what we can do to support you. It depends on how much money we have to support you. Right. So you can ask if uh, we can cover shipping for you. If we really want the work, we'll figure out how to pay for that. Um, if you're having questions about framing, because framing a show can be ridiculously cost prohibitive, ask if the museum or the institution has exhibition frames, right? Try to work within the framework of what is available to you from the institution, and we will be happy to work with you and tell you, yes, this is an option. No, this is not an option. Um, ask what you can do to help promote or support the exhibition. Um, you can ask for a marketing plan. Uh, we may not have it in our heads when we work with you, when we start first start talking to you, but as we start building the exhibition, we, we definitely have something. Um, and so that way, you know how we are going to present you in the, in the best possible light. Um, and then ask questions. Always, always, always ask questions. I don't mind getting 50 emails 
Um, I've gotten lots of artists that continue to send me one question at a time. I'd prefer that you gang them all together so that it's <laughs> one email, but okay. Um, because if one question leads to another question, it leads to another question, that's okay. As long as all the questions get answered um, and as long as we're both clear with each other about our intentions. So does all that make sense? Very much so. Okay. I'm a big proponent of paperwork and timelines. I think that's the Virgo in me probably, hmm. you know, I, well, who knows, but uh, two person and three person and group shows, never a bad idea. I know that some people want the brass ring and want the solo exhibition, but as a gallerist, I had more people come in for two person and three person exhibitions because it draws more people. Someone might come in to see somebody else's work and fall in love with yours. And it isn't, in, it isn't what they had anticipated doing. Um, you know, in a gallery context, uh, if someone is having a conversation and they're, they're talking about a certain type of, you know, what do you collect? What do you, what do you love about photography? And there's something in a drawer that can come out too. So there's, there's always an opportunity. Um, so themed exhibitions with multiple artists, can often add depth to your own work because we as curators see something in the work that when we put your work next to somebody else's can actually broaden and deepen the ideas of, of what it is that you're trying to say. So we're telling stories with your work as you tell stories to us. Um, again, it, part of the conversation, if, uh, if a curator reaches out to you and says, I'd really love this work, if you think that we've missed the point of your work, Let's talk about it and figure out what I missed. Um, and that way we can have a conversation and you may not have the particular image that I love might not be a fit, but you might have something else because we clearly love your work. We love your aesthetic. Uh, we're interested in what it is that you have to say. So there's always opportunities. Um, and then location, location, location. When you're working with a gallery or you're working with an institution, um, those two person or three person shows um, play when the curator puts your work next to somebody, they're trying to say something uh, in a smaller gallery space. If your work is ganged together in one location, it might have a broader um, or more impactful presence than somewhere in a back corner somewhere else or um, and now, of course, online, which we haven't really quite got to yet what we're about to so uh, you know, working uh, with the advent of, of COVID, we're now going online in, in very different ways. So that adds a whole nother dimension to how we view, see, and, and show your work. Okay, online versus galleries. Um, I think that, you know, I have a very unique experience in that I came to the Griffin on March 1st of 2020. So the job that I thought I had that was gonna be very in-person became very alone for months. Uh, we closed the second week of March and didn't reopen again until our summer show in July. So I spent a lot of time with work on the walls that nobody got to see. But the, the flip side to that was we went deep and long uh, with online, in, it, online artist talks, online exhibitions, uh, we tried every way we could to make sure that as many people were visible and that we were out in front talking about photography in a way that we hadn't had that opportunity before. And, and I'm not even sure it was that we didn't have the opportunity. We didn't have the technology and we didn't have the push. And I think COVID really pushed us to look at how we reach our public, how we connect with our patrons in a way and give them uh, opportunities to see work in a, in a new way. So uh, with David Sokosh, uh, David has a incredible book of cyanotypes. And while the work looks okay in a JPEG, it definitely is one of those things that has to be seen, felt, touched in person. So, you know, how do you make sure that your object oriented work is uh, well represented online? And I would say for that, um, having high quality JPEGs um, that give us that tactile quality, um, having images that show us what the piece looks like inside to, you know, 
um, the depth of the image or the depth of the, the piece, if it's a freestanding piece, um, that kind of thing. Does that all make sense to everybody? I think going forward, um, I know that the Griffin is planning on a, a robust online program. Um, we are working with multiple curators right now to create conversations and curated exhibitions uh, that will be visible online to not only our members, but to a broader public. Um, you know, people don't necessarily make it out to Winchester very often, uh, but when they do, we're more than happy to show them the work, but we also wanna make sure that uh, someone in California can join us too, or we have uh, people join us from Austria or Denmark or Korea or Japan. So, you know, I, my goal is to get the work out to as many people as often as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you've got the work up. Now you've uh, done your due diligence. You've signed your contract. What happens next? All right, keep up with us. Let us know. Uh, that you're going to be in town, we might be able to pull together a lunchtime chat or, you know, make sure that uh, we've got your help in promoting the exhibition. Um, make yourself available for interviews. If we have someone from the Boston Globe coming to take a look at the work and they have further questions, can we make sure that he can, they can reach you uh, to answer any questions about the work and that helps promote not only you, but, uh, but the institution as well. Um, artist Talks, we're doing again, um, online Artist Talks and hopefully as COVID continues to recede uh, in-person events as well. So we're trying to make sure that there are brown bag lunches with conversations with artists available as well as evening presentations. So um, also, as you move forward, uh, be ready for the end of the exhibition. Write to us if, if, because we are busy and because I do my, try to do as much as possible, um, I do try to reach out early enough to make sure that we have a conversation about how that work's coming back or what needs to happen. Does it need to go to another institution, right? So the more clarity we have, the earlier on, the easier it is for us to pack it, prepare it and, and get it out the door in a, in a timely fashion for you. Grace, uh, this image of Grace Weston, one that I love. Uh, Grace, I represented for probably close to a decade and she is a master at promotion and at follow-up. She makes herself absolutely readily available to you for any reason at any time. Um, if you've got a question about pricing or about availability of a print, she is right there. Now, not everybody can be as on top of it as possible, but um, making yourself available to your institution or to your gallery is always um, always a benefit to you. Okay. Before, before we do the what not to do, yep. one of the points that Marco made, can you talk about artist statements? How important is the writing to you? Does a statement ever change your mind about the visuals you're seeing? Absolutely, every time. Um, I. It, you know, everybody says, well, we're a visual meeting and you should just get it. Sometimes I don't. I'm a little dense every once in a while. It happens. So giving me a coherent artist statement, I can look at that artist statement and then I can look at the work. And in many cases, I can see more about what it is that you're trying to say. I can grow from that interaction or I can say, you know what, you went to that artist statement generator and you pulled all this stuff out with all these big words that have literally nothing to do with the prints. And you're trying to make sure that it is more than it is. Sometimes it's just uh, a little bit more simple, but yeah, no, I think artist statements are important. And if you don't know how to write one, that's okay. Because a curator can help you with that. Uh, other artists can help you with that. We can all help you define your vision. I had an artist that I worked with who could not write to save his life. So we started with real simple exercises of, okay, write down the words, right? What do these images mean to you? And, and, and just put them in words. And then we gathered the words up and we created sentences. And I was like, okay, so this sentence is right or this sentence is wrong? No, it's this. Okay, great. So then we move on and grab the sentences and create paragraphs. And so 
it's a long drawn out process, but it was valuable for him because all of a sudden he had an artist statement and a way to um, talk concisely about his work that he didn't have before. I'd also say, make sure that you know how to talk about your work in a very quick format. I can't, I, I don't have an hour to have a conversation about your work. I, not always, unless I'm so engaged that I literally pretend like everything else has just gone away. Um, but the, the more concise you can be about your work, about its intentions, the more I know that you know about the work in a way that is, uh, that's meaningful. That was going to be my next point to make to you, because that's what I teach in this in this program is how to talk about your work, how to learn how to talk about your work. Um, so it's the statement and it's also being able to to say what it means to you in order to put the ideas across to someone else. So thanks for that. Sure. But it's also about hearing what others have to say about your work, mm -hmm. because there's a, a point at which. I may see something in the work that may be absolutely under no circumstances your intention. So how did I miss that, right? Is it in, is it in how you wrote your statement? Is it in how your work um, is portrayed? Is it in the image itself, right? Um, there's no, I, I'd love to say there's no wrong answers. It, there's always something, but um, be able to have a back and forth and and go deep into that image or that series um, so that I can gain more from that if I have misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so what not to do. There's lots of things what not to do. I tried to keep this one really clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, not meeting deadlines, right? Um, not following up I mean I think the big one for me is not following up from an inquiry from a curator right that's a missed opportunity mm -hmm. um I know that we're super busy and I know that you write to us right after that portfolio review and we might not get back to you for months it doesn't mean that we're ignoring you it doesn't mean that we're we're no longer interested it just means literally we're super big because getting back from a portfolio review we've just met with i don't know 60 80 people maybe or however many and we're we have to go through all of that my vacation is over. my vote my photo vacation is over so now i got to get back to work and now it's trying to carve out time to make those connections again so definitely follow up definitely have patience just we'll get there um, and if you don't hear from us in a while give us a couple of months and try it again you know, at a certain point, we're going to say no, Moss, right? Um, just we'll, we'll get there, but um, it's always worth a shot. So um, not communicating and it's too, until it's too late to change anything. Um, if you have created an exhibition with your curator and you decide that that 17 by 22 should be a 20 by 30 because it just looks better and you send us the 20 by 30 but we don't have the room for it mm -hmm. that doesn't put you on the top of the list of of very helpful artists to work with right because you've now made decisions on on our behalf that we we now have to deal with that we may not have the space or time to deal with mm -hmm. um so always, always, always be ahead of the game. Um, make sure that, uh, you know, I'm trying to make sure that uh, any of my exhibitions are, are comfortable and, and ready to go at least a few months in advance, if not closer to say six, so, you know, or, or longer so that we have plenty of time in case something comes up. If an image is suddenly no longer available or a shipping company is not going to pick up in a timely fashion, right? We have time to make sure that we can deal with that kind of stuff. Sending us the information or saying, oh crap, it's not shipping until tomorrow and the show hangs and I have installers waiting for that piece, that doesn't help us at all. Um, making changes to your show and not discussing it with your curator. Don't swap out images at the last moment saying, I think this is better, right? Without having that conversation. That happens uh, often enough. Uh, don't send us a final installation layout without having a conversation first. Um, I think, you know, clearly with this group of things, it is all about, again, that communication with your curator, uh, with um, making sure that you are collaborating and not 
handing over this thing and expecting us to say thank you and take care of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that is my, my big uh, professional list of what not to do. Um, there's plenty of other what not to do's like we discussed the, the bathroom thing definitely leave me my personal time. So, and then this was my last slide. So hopefully uh, after you've gone through this uh, little program, uh, you can head to Art Basel like Buzz does uh, often. So um, that is all I've got. Does anyone have any more questions? Um, I don't see any more. Anyone want to quickly put a question into the chat box or a comment? I hope I haven't bored you all into just. No, somewhere. I've learned a whole lot, which is, uh, which is great, which is what I wanted. I did, and and I just want to reiterate one thing that seems to be a um, a through line for your talk, which is the collaborative effect of between the artist and the gallerist or the curator or the museum um, person. And that I think often people just think, you know, you want my work, I turn it over to you and boom, that's that. And I like the fact that you talked a lot in a lot of the different situations about the collaborative effect of discussion about not making changes without making it a part of, of the discussion. Um, I just think that's really an important aspect. And I thought it was a through line for you. Um, Let's see, we have a couple of things here that just popped up. Um, Marcy Duran, I would love to hear more about your thoughts about moving image and new directions for the Griffin. I am um, obsessed. I, for probably the last five or six years, I wanted to do a gift show. So my obsession is to have iPads all over the walls and have things running through them or to, I, I think that we have created this entire body of work that is all digital. Um, I have um, one of my new employees um, is a, a master student and he did his thesis with a video filled with still images. Um, uh, there's an a, a artist pair named Louvier and Vanessa and they're based in New Orleans and they do yeah. unbelievable work um, mm -hmm. creating um, cyanotypes or alternative process work and then layering them as if it were some type of animated feature. So um, I love the idea of using photography to create that sort of movement. Um, uh, Xuan Shui Eng, I'm, I know I'm going to butcher that name, uh, who we have coming up for an artist talk, did some unbelievable videos that are immersive. Um, Minnie Lee also does some incredible video that is um, just contemplative in a way that allows us to be part of that picture. Um, so that's uh, more of, of what I'm looking at and I'm looking at expanding. Last year we did something called member projections and I'm looking forward to doing that at least another couple of times. Uh, doing calls for entry uh, for artists to have 10 images that will be put to some type of, of music, or we might be able to do just slideshows and you can, you can put your own music to that and we'll, we'll move those forward. So I think that showing that body of work in a, in a movement sort of way um, also expands the medium. Okay, um, let's see, Daniel, Gonsalves, have I pronounced your name correctly? I hope. Says, congrats, Krista, for everything and thank you for this presentation. What is your favorite part of the process on your end? Oh, looking at work, which I never get to do enough of. Um, for me, it's, again, that collaborative effort of, of me working with an artist, finding the work that engages both of us, finding work that we think uh, a broader public is interested in, having those conversations, talking about the statement, talking about where the work is gonna go or who it's gonna impact, um, what kind of um, ideas that we can promote. Um, that to me is my, my favorite, the, the creative aspect by far. Um, pushing spreadsheets, which is what I did for the last two years as an associate director, not quite as fun on any level, um, but certainly uh, kept me busy for sure. 
Uh, William Maloney says, what is the typical policy about signing work and where is it typically appropriate to sign your work? I am not a fan of in front. I, because then it becomes about your signature on the front image as opposed to the image itself. So my suggestion is always on the back uh, and also in pencil in the image frame. So where the, because what happens is you can't control who your buyer is. You can't control who's gonna purchase your work and how they're gonna frame it. Um, you can beg someone to frame it your way. Uh, when I opened Wallspace, I, I got framed images from everybody so that all of my artists could show how they wanted to see that work on the wall. I never sold one of those framed images. They, uh, they sat in storage for a long time as I started moving around because uh, our collectors and our patrons um, have very specific ways of how they wanna see things framed, how it's gonna hang in their house, you know, what kind of glass they need. So um, they also trim full bleed when you may wanna put an eight ply mat around the image, right? So if you put your signature at the bottom of that piece of paper, it might get cut off if they decide to go full bleed, right? In order to trim to be what they need it to be. So if you sign it on the back in the image area with the pertinent information, so uh, your provenance of, you know, edition number, all of that kind of stuff, um, that is one way to do it. The other option is to create a label that goes with it. So that if that, if that signature gets sliced off, you can have a provenance label that someone can adhere to the back of a finished framed print. Okay, Terry Owen says, I enjoyed the presentation and learned some important things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad I made sense. I'm oh, always worried totally, about that. Totally. Tom says, Krista, thank you for a great talk. I love that you brought up the distinction, the distractions that prints and technical problems like poor color management can be during portfolio reviews. We love good prints here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Olga good. Merrill, thanks you. Vivian says, great. Vivian A says, great and informative talk. Thank you, Krista. Um, Zona says, Thanks for sharing. I know more about how curation works and how to build connections because of your talk today. Really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Flack asks, any preferred size for portfolio reviews? Something that's manageable. Um, one of the problems that it, when you go to Houston or Portland or uh, Santa Fe, you have these people that want to show you these 40 by 60 prints. Well, this is how it's supposed to look, right? Bring one of those. Mm -hmm. put it on the side somewhere, but bring prints that we can actually look at on a table and not have to worry about. And please don't bring the gloves. Make sure that <laughs> like, it's going to be a, it's going to be a work print in five days. So many people are going to handle it just on it. Like if you have a, an object that is so precious, bring one mm -hmm. and then we'll handle that with the gloves. But in order for us to have a, 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 a a talk that is that is meaningful in that speed dating arena that we're in of 20 minutes or 25 minutes, right? You wanna talk about the work. You don't wanna talk about the fact that you're holding this thing with gloves. Um, also, don't be, don't be afraid to let us handle the prints. Um, as curators, as collectors, um, we, do, we hope to God we should know how to handle prints by now. So, let us play with the prints, let us sequence the prints for you. Let us like engage us in conversation and let us be immersed in your work. Um, so I would say back to the original question, what size? No more than 16 by 20. I mean, you can say this is supposed to be 30 by 40 and here's the print over here, right? This is what it should look like because then we can identify it, see it, but we still have the image information and also the ideas and intent behind your work right in front of us that we can have the conversation about. All right. I wanna thank you so much, Krista, for doing this. Thank you. And for all the information, I know for me, it was a real learning experience. It was stuff that I wanted to know about, but didn't. So I really appreciate that. Everybody else is thanking you. Um, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for putting up with me for an hour. I uh, huh. I am grateful. And if you receive mailers from people who came to this talk, don't be surprised. That might That's happen. Fine. I will take them. That might very well happen. I I look forward to them. I have a, a stack. So in my storage unit, I have uh, probably twenty boxes of submissions. Um, I, if you send me something, I feel a personal responsibility to, to care for that object. So I have um, submissions from the very day I opened my gallery in 2005, and they are stuck in storage. And everybody's like, oh, you know, you probably should start tossing those out. And there's some that probably could go out. But you know, I learned something. If I go back into my box from 2008, and I see who submitted work to me and where they are now, Right. Or that it might have been a, an incredible body of work that they did in 2008. And they sent me a dog that can't hunt in 2016 or 2020. Right. Mm -hmm. So you just never know. So um, I'm happy to take your postcards. I am happy to have conversations. If you have questions about anything that I talked about, I'm more than happy to clarify it because I know I can talk in circles and I can just keep going. And then all of a sudden you're like, what, what? So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, I want to thank you very much. I really appreciate your doing this, Krista. And it was fantastic. And I think we all agree on that. Thank you. Applause, applause. And thank you all for coming to the talk. Don't forget two weeks from now, we're going to have David Burnett, an extraordinary photojournalist with an arc of a career that you would not believe. So don't miss that. And continue to come to these talks. Thank you all for being here. And I hope to see you all at the Griffin either online or in person sometime soon. <laughs>